Okay, we start with um, the fact that it's a draft. Obviously, all of the um, necessary pieces of information. And then on page two, you'll see that I began with my mission statement. And this was a, it's an unusual, unique campaign in that it is a township level, much smaller than even a city councilman or councilor position. Um, so you can read through the mission, but it is very clear. And that's probably the most important thing to note. The next thing we did was put together a timeline for the actual candidate. You want some candidate information, and it ended up being a little bit more extensive than we thought. We move on to platform issues, and then the opponent. The person that I ran against, um, which we can see here, I wanted to know everything that I possibly could about her. Why is that important? Mostly because I want to be able to strategically plan every part of my interaction with the community, knowing what hers is also going to be. Because when you are running, you know that your opponent has a campaign plan. It's best to understand what theirs may look like so that you can prepare yours. In this particular campaign, I listed the three largest obstacles, and then we moved on to the win number. And the win number is gonna be in a whole separate training, and I'm going to run through this first campaign plan kind of quickly, and then we're gonna go into what a, a sample campaign, campaign plan is for a state level race. So I'm not gonna focus on the win numbers, but in this particular situation or this race, the um, district had about 5,000 voters, and because it was a newly redistricted district, um, and because of the nature of the race, say for 2016 and the presidential election, we anticipated this particular district to have a 95% turnout, which we have to keep in mind while we are communicating or calculating our win numbers. So for this race, this candidate needed 1,648 votes to win. Why is that important? Because you have to have a set number of contacts per person in order to get that that win number. So if you need 1,600 votes, you're going to have to touch, I don't know, 80% more people three times before you can actually win their vote or convert their vote. And we'll talk about voter conversion more when we have our win number conversation. But how do we do that? So we have to have fundraising goals. We have to have events, um, canvassing schedule. In this particular race, it was nearly impossible to organize phone banks because it was such a new district. Um, and then we have our outreach. So to get to 1,648 votes, we had to have 25,000 people touched. How do we do that? We have to have money. So the next step is to figure out how much money it costs to be able to reach 25,000 residents. And then we talk about how, and that's where we go through events and canvassing, um, and then what our needs are. Obviously, one of the most important aspects of a campaign plan is to identify your community influencers so that you can involve them in your campaign. Creating a calendar, finding events in order to be able to have your four tabling events and your six meet and greets, and then non-virtual fundraising events along with virtual fundraising events, your canvassing schedule, and then having and aligning a PR plan, which we will also discuss in a future training. We added the map here because it was a new district. We wanted to have a visual inside the plan for the campaign manager so that we could see everything easily. And then, of course, we set up where all of the campaign candidate presence was. The candidate imaging was included in the campaign plan, as well as the collection of endorsements. And this is important and not necessarily in some of the other campaign campaign plans that we'll talk about later because and I believe this wholly, and this may be just me, but having everything you need at your fingertips is what the plan is for. First of all, having everything written is the most magnificent step because if it's not written, it's not real. But having access to everything right at your fingertips in one location will help you immensely throughout any of your campaigns. 
and then some more endorsements. And then I actually included the PR list for everything that is necessary for this particular local level campaign race. And this is all of the local PR information and then everything that's related to the city as well. And then I went on to my platform issues. I This particular campaign was focused on creating a restorative justice system within the township level or at the township level to replace um, small claims court or at least to move it faster to replace some of the costs because eventually we want to not spend the taxpayer money on this. So I went over how to do that and how to use it as a volunteer tool. And then the fundraising plan, um, because we're going through this quickly and we also have another training on fundraising, I just want to make note that if we have 25,000 people, each one of them is going to cost some amount of money. So you have to be able to calculate what the, the number of what your outreach number is to how much it costs to touch them. And then we start backwards. Once you have that number, we add 20 to 30 percent, depending on what you think your fundraising skills are. And then we start from a higher number like this. 4,900 is more than the 35 that we actually need. Why? Because this is what we have possible. We want to make sure that we have a cushion so we can get what we actually need. And then the first thing you need to do for fundraising here is to have 10 people that you know that you can ask for $100 each from, five people that you can get $500, and then reoccurring payday donations for 5 to $10 from 35 people. Because this was such a small campaign, this these numbers work perfectly. When we move on to the larger campaigns, that number will change drastically. And I'm going to unmute you before we move on to the next campaign plan so that you can ask questions about this particular race. Anybody have any questions? I feel like I went through that really quickly. That made sense to everybody? Uh, I think so. Okie dokie. Okay. <clears throat> so the first thing you do when you've decided that you are going to look at running for some office is make a campaign timeline. This is in addition to your actual campaign plan, so I'm not going to do a whole, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time here, but I would like to at least go over it quickly. Before you make a decision, you want to do some soul searching. You want to talk to your family, your spouse, your significant other, um, your partners, possibly even your employers and um, your children. And then you're going to talk to find um, some people that you trust that you can communicate more openly and you know will be honest with you. And then you start planning, building your teams, managing your committees, and then you write your campaign plan. I'm going to mute you guys again real quick. Um, <clears throat> we um, came by recently a campaign plan for a libertarian running for state senate. He did some of the same things that we saw on my campaign plan for the local race, even um, even though it's the state Senate. So there are some differences, but he went over what the campaign is um, and spoke just a little bit about his incumbent. And then he went on to his mission as well as execution. He also phased out his campaign. And I think this is important because it's an, it's an interesting step that didn't occur in the last campaign plan because it was such a small race. So phase one, we start, generally speaking, you want to start two years and you're planning before your actual election. So if your election is November 2018, this is something that you should have started ideally last November. So that would be phase one. And then phase two is when you actually start getting out there and fundraising um, 
calling people, asking for money. And I don't know that I would call phase two name recognition, but in this particular candidate's campaign plan, he chose to. The third phase is to either win the primary or to win um, the nomination, depending on which party you are and what state you're in. Um, so in this particular state, this campaign or this candidate needed to win a primary, and so that would be phase three. The fourth phase is should be getting out there and talking to people, um, depending on whether or not you are running contested. But now that we are moving beyond a party level nomination, we are moving into a general election, and here we are now. Everybody needs to be shaking hands with as many people as you possibly can. At this point, you should have an ongoing fundraising campaign that doesn't require a lot of effort. This is the point where you need to be in front of as many people and not asking them for money. This is where you talk to them about your issues and separate yourself from the other candidate. Um, but I think most of you know that. The point is that it's written down. And then he goes on to phase six and seven and then eight. And I like the fact that he focused on early voting. This is something that I think we should all include in our campaign plans. And in the sample that I'm going to show you momentarily, you'll see that they've also included that. And then phase nine, which is from October 29th up through Election Day. And this is the phase where when you write your schedule, you are going to be spending 20 hours a day yourself along with the higher level volunteers and maybe even some of your low level volunteers. Um, 20 hours a day working on your campaign. This is going to be something that, that you'll have in your actual schedule, which you should include in your campaign plan. And then we'll look at the next one as soon as I open the floor for your questions. Uh, do you mind sending me some of this material? I mean, like, uh, I have a friend who's probably not going to have this for the Feldman Foundation just for the sake of crunching everyone's 2018 elections, but uh, like, some of this material looks like it'd be uh, pretty useful for him to set up his campaign. Yes, um, I'm actually going to, at the end, ask everybody for emails, or actually I can probably just throw it into the chat that I started, um, and there you will also find your homework. But yeah, these um, resources are <laughs> readily available. Who's laughing? Okay. Yes, you get homework. <laughs> yeah, that'd be me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, is that the only question? Oh, thanks, by the way. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay, so this is the actual campaign plan on my screen. You can't see it, can you? Hang on one second. Can you see this? Yes. Yep. OK, cool. OK, this is the actual perfect example of a campaign plan. It doesn't go into the detail that you really need to have, but it does have an overview that is extremely useful. Um, this particular campaign plan includes a table of contents. Again, something really useful. Um, it also includes the timeline, which we kind of perused through the pre-timeline, the pre-campaign plan timeline. Um, but you'll see when we get through this about, you'll see the schedule, which is super cool. So page one is your strategy overview. This is that thing that the last campaign plan looked at, but didn't go into probably enough detail. Um, not sure what that particular candidate's campaign looks like at the present time, but if I were writing the plan for a um, statewide race, it would definitely have a much larger overview. And also, this campaign plan includes a lot of the incumbents or his opponents' information, again, which I believe wholeheartedly is necessary. You need to know them as well as they know you, and depending on what your party is, sometimes better. It goes over targeting, and this is important to focus on real quick because this is going to be included in your homework. We have, hang on one second. Sorry about that. My um, 
puppy apparently has problems. Okay, so targeting. This is um, the same thing that you saw on the last two, but it will be a part of your homework for um, the campaign plan that I shared in that chat. So this is going to be a little bit important in particular because Jesse's campaign is going to be won by focusing on people that are not party loyal. So once we get over to his campaign plan, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but specifically targeting your base, how you win, is going to be one of the most important pieces of your plan. Identifying your roles and responsibilities for everybody that's on your team, because before you decided to run, you already picked out your cabinet, you're already going to know whose roles are what, and then you should list them here. This should not just say candidate, it should say the candidate's name, and then what you expect of yourself. Your campaign manager, what do you expect of that person? Um, treasurer and finance director oftentimes are probably going to be the same person, but you can combine that role into one and name that person and, and list what their duties are. Your volunteer coordinator, um, interns may or may not be something that we all have that can be identified as um, a handful of different things. And then your go-to volunteers, they're calling your kitchen cabinet, um, we'll go We'll call those probably something different later. Sorry about that. Okay. And then we move on to the message. And again, I'm going to send all of this to you. Um, and this is going to be another part of your homework. So we're going to focus on targeting and messaging for our homework. The message should not just be one page. Um, I believe that in my campaign plan, it was pretty small because of the race. But generally, actually, no, I think we had probably four pages total of the actual real message and the implement the implementation of that message. Um, so this is something that we want to focus on a large scale. You'll see that this is obviously just a sample, but you'll see that they actually went into issue by issue for each individual opponent and the candidate. And then an actual event schedule. And I think this is the first time we've actually seen a broken down schedule. And this is also a huge necessity. But I think this is going to be a piece that we discuss later on in a future training. So we will kind of peruse past this for now. Again, your outreach, voter contact, how do you make that happen? what the benchmarks are and because this is a much larger race this was a is a fantastic example 981 doors knocked in june 4900 in july and so on and <clears throat> this will be something that you can update throughout your campaign because your campaign plan can be a live document it will be ever-changing, though only slightly. So you can update exactly what your benchmarks are in goals and what they have actually come to fruition. And then a plan for early voting and absentee voting. Because so many people are getting their vote out early, you can't depend on GOTV for last-ditch efforts for campaign. We have to prepare for 25, depending on your district, you have to prepare for 25% of people to have voted before the last three months of the election. Volunteer plan, uh, very similar to the other things that we have already discussed. And then <clears throat> outreach here, this one is interesting because it identifies, not many, but it identifies varying um, actual voter demographics that they're going after. Um, so student parents, 
Um, we want to sometimes, if you, if you want to focus on millennials or veterans or what have you, you would identify those things here. Um, community outreach, I think we've discussed quite in depth. Um, and the, the finance plan, again, is going to be a future training. But I look, I look, I look at this and I'm pleased by how they've divided up exactly where they want to raise money from particular things. So if you have a direct mail campaign, how much should that net you in funds? And so I like how they broke that out, but they've also got, or it says that they've got a detailed finance plan in addition to what they've shown here. And then the timeline, and here is the schedule. Here is the schedule for the early part of the campaign. So we would call this phases one through eight. Um, but you can see that we've got actual time set aside. If you know that from nine to 10 every day, you're supposed to be on the phone, that's probably fundraising time. You're gonna have a list of people to call and you're gonna sit down and be on the phone. If you don't have this as a schedule, it's probably not gonna happen. It'll be one of those things that will happen maybe tomorrow or the next day, or you can procrastinate, or when somebody says, hey, can you sit down and make these phone calls? Having a schedule is necessary. This is gorgeous. And then not just for yourself, but for your campaign manager. And then it also holds you both accountable. And then this is the same thing as the phases that we saw on the last campaign plan, except that I like that it also includes LTEs, which wasn't included in the last two that we looked at. And that was it for this one. Whoops. Okay, I'm going to open the floor for questions while I pull up the um, campaign plan that we're going to use for homework. Any questions? I'll go ahead and throw in another one. Okay. Um, so are we uh, trying to find anything else that's uh, useful as opposed to Text Plus? So yeah, I know it's uh, it can get a bit tedious using that app because you keep uh, opening and closing, opening and closing, like. As like I've never tried sending multiple messages at the same time because I was I figured it end up sending it as like a group chat to a bunch of strangers and that just get confusing. I have not used Text Plus to be completely honest, so I don't know that I'm the right person <laughs> to address that question to. Um, I would almost suggest switching over to uh, Google and using their service that way now instead of just text plus or whatever the other app was um uh, also sending, sending group text mm -hmm. uh we should not do either jared can you repeat that last sentence sending group text we should not be doing oh yeah 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 uh what was that app you suggested i would just go to what is it google there's one text whatever. free text free is really good is that missing we can yeah, use text, text, free. text plus or whatever Google's phone service is because you can use texting for that too. Um, okay, so I just noticed that you guys have some chat stuff. Um, that was a two by two strengths and weakness grid. And it was also, um, we I'm, I used it in my example as an issues um, for strengths and weaknesses. So yes, and <laughs> George Hustle is the goal. I would love to be able to use Hustle. It's not cheap. So um, depending on how we forge forward in the future and whether or not our fund, our own fundraising, TFF's fundraising efforts increase substantially, we may not be able to use Hustle. There will be some campaigns that will have it that we'll be working with in the future. Um, so that that's something to look forward to. I love <laughs> Hustle. Okay, on my screen, I hope that you can see the beginning or the, the 
bones of a campaign plan for Jesse Fullington. Um, <clears throat> we have a handful of things on here that will be important at later steps, events, donation goals, media engagement, LTE, canvassing plan, phone banking. That's all going to come later. Um, our first step is to identify the win number, which has been completed for us. Thank you, Jared. Um, and our voter contacts, this is our outreach number. So because we have the win number and the outreach number, we need to now target, we need to figure out what our target is and solidify the message. So this will be, this is where we actually have homework. I want to see how much of what we discussed today or how much we went through quickly, you guys were able to understand and put into action. So everybody has this. I just want you to add two sections, targeting and messaging, and let's see what you guys can come up with. Any questions? Would you like to discuss what a work hour is since we've done this plan? Um, I just closed the plan. What a work hour is? Yeah. Are you talking about an FTE? Yes. Sure. Okay. Um, a work hour, no. You've got, you're on a different page than me. Why don't you go ahead? Because I'm not sure where you're headed with this. Uh, I've, I've always done a work hour as being how many contacts need to be made per per day, per hour. So if you can have it be an hour or you can do however many contacts you want done for each day that you have a volunteer that is phone banking or doing any sort of outreach contacting uh, voters. Uh, and then I've always divided it by a reasonable number of voter contacts, uh, especially if it's going to be via phone or text. Obviously, those are going to be easier to get if it's one on one or canvassing. Uh, those are going to take more time. Uh, so I usually kind of divvy them up about halfway in between to find a, a number that I think should fit uh, for how many contacts each each uh, volunteer should get. Um, they're not too hard to understand, usually. Okay. Does everybody understand that? I think that was pretty straightforward. Okay, so what I think you're seeing on my screen right now is the demographics of Jesse's race. Um, this is from the 2015 census. These are the three counties that are relevant to him. Um, it shows our um, ethnicity, the veteran population, males to females, and then the age groups. And one of the things that we are starting to learn as a liberty-focused group in general is that if we target 16 to 25-year-olds, one, we eliminate the possibility of somebody changing the channel, turning the page, or tuning out. Why? Because 16-year-olds at dinner time are an active um, audience where they, they provide you with an active audience. So if you can convince a 16-year-old that you are the right candidate, 16 to 18, they're going to talk to their parents about it at dinner time. The 16 to 25-year-old group is not party loyal. They are independent voters when they vote, and they vote with passion. That means that they're going to talk. And who are they going to talk to? Anybody that will listen, especially if it's somebody that they think will have an opposing opinion. That is the nature of our young people. Let's put them to work. So if we target in that particular area, what is our message going to be? It's going to be a specific message. It's going to be something that has to invoke passion. And how are we going to utilize that impassioned message? How do we get it out there? How do we talk to this age group? That's going to be what we are focused on for our homework. Now, millennials are not the only, and millennials and, and lower actually, are not the only targeted demographic for any particular race, including this one. So um, I would probably look at, you've got a pretty high poverty rate in these three county, counties. I would probably look at targeting some of this and definitely the veteran population. The veteran population could win this race for him. 
all by itself. Um, we're going into probably things that are a lot more about where to sell the message and how to sell the message, so we don't really need some of that stuff. Um, but you can look at this, and this is another thing that I'm going to send you. You can look at this and take a look at who's voting. This particular district does not have a strong voter turnout. And I'm curious about the reason for that, which is why I think maybe focusing on some of the um, impoverished community may have a lot to do with increasing your voter turnout. Not a whole lot of racial diversity and a lot of high school graduates. I don't think I have anything else here. Okay, so I'm gonna send all of this to you. You guys have any questions about what we are doing? Jared says we have an unchallenged incumbent. That, that's why turnout has been low. I don't think we're looking at turnout just for this particular race. I think we're looking at total turnout. So it wouldn't just be, I mean, the voters in this particular district are just not leaving their houses. Yeah, that seems to be the case year over year. Yeah. And I can't figure it out, but fortunately, we have an ever-growing population of young people to get out to the polls um, for your race, Jesse. Okay, so I'm going to let you guys get to work. Um, George has a question. If you're poor, no bus service, how do you get to the polls? There's two questions here. One of them is relevant to whether or not if you require an actual driver's license. Jesse, does the state of Tennessee require a driver's license to vote? Uh, no, we uh, we don't. Okay. Yeah, I've never, yeah. Okay, so oh, there are- Sorry, last. Go ahead. Oh, sorry, I'm, <laughs> I'm in the middle of driving, so it threw me off for a second, sorry. Okay. Okay, so um, George, to answer your question, there are a handful of ways. One of them, as Jared mentioned in the chat, is absentee. Um, and also it presumes education, that's true. So in Indianapolis, we have um, not an awful voter turnout like they do there, um, but it's also a little bit easier to get things together here. But here's what we did here. Um, work with your Lyft and Uber companies that offer free rides to, for some things and get them to yeah, help you to get, help the get the vote out. Also, you can put into your financial plan, to rent um, vans that hold 15 people and start picking people up at churches or in community centers or at their house if they're disabled if you need to. Get volunteers with cars to get out there and get people to the polls. Okay. Well, I would, I would, Go ahead. Oh, I would say, like, especially like with my area being mostly rural, like I've already talked with several churches about running bus like their church bus services because out here like we don't have Lyft and Uber like the closest place is you know four or five hours away that has either one of them so if you live in rural areas a good way to do like is you're already going to need to outreach to your church communities anyways especially in rural to just be like hey you know like when election season comes up would y'all mind you know running some of the you know less fortunate people to the polls that's a great idea and for the church, it's a win-win. Like the church wants community outreach. What better way than to you know get people on your you know church bus and then give them their you know then do their church thing while helping you out at the same time. Right. I think that is fantastic. But whatever whatever we do have to do, that should be something that's in the campaign plan, especially for your race, because I honestly you have a really awful turnout down there. So we need to get people engaged somehow. Engaging young people is only one way, and if you don't hold their interest right up to voting, they're also going to trail off. So having a, a set plan to get people out to vote is fantastic. 
Okay, I'm going to send everybody the, the um, examples that I used and also the instructions for what I'm looking for with regard to targeting and messaging pieces that you guys are going to add in. And um, if you have any questions, feel free to chat in that thread and I'll be happy to answer anything. Um, Jesse, before I hang up, let uh, Paige know that I recorded this so she won't miss anything and I will send you guys a link. Okay, cool. All right. Thanks, everybody, for coming on, and I look forward to working with you on Jesse's plan. <laughs>